I'm Joe Devine, and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. Before we get started today, I'd like to let listeners know that our summer campaign begins tomorrow. Uh, For seven weeks, we'll be releasing videos on the history of the World Cup. Tomorrow, which is Tuesday the 6th of June, our first video comes out, which is a tactical history of the period between the first ever World Cup in 1930 and the tournament in Brazil in 1950. Each week we'll be releasing a tactical video covering a particular era, a a brief history video in which episodes will be dedicated to the stories of specific tournaments, and a new segment called Classic Goal, um, which I'll I'll let you infer yourselves. Podcasts during this time will also be related to the history of the tournament, so if you've got any questions, do let us know, and we'll do our best to answer them during the podcasts. Also, as I speak, uh, we are rapidly approaching 100,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is, um, frankly, amazing. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to to our subscribers um, from everyone here at UMAX at Football. It's a really special feeling, and we're really appreciative. If you haven't subscribed... Uh, You can help us out and help us get to that 100k figure. And also, you can listen to this podcast on iTunes and SoundCloud. Links are provided in the description. A final note, and sorry, this has been an extra long introduction. Um, Please also head over to umaxit.com to check out our editorial site. We have four or five excellent articles going out every day. If you like our videos, you might like those articles too. Today I'm speaking to Seb, who is the sub-editor of the site. Um, so please go and check that out and also please follow us on uh, Twitter at UMAXITFootball okay that's all thanks very much today I'm joined by Seb Stafford Bloor sub-editor for UMAXIT.com our editorial site we're discussing cup finals manager movements and three at the back based criticisms Seb you were at Wembley uh, for the championship playoff game between Reading and Huddersfield. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the day and what, what you think Huddersfield, the victors, and uh, and David Wagner might might bring to the Premier League next season? Um, it was quite a hard question to answer because I think um, the, the, the championship final, is playoff final, is um, obviously, I mean, as far as occasions go, it's pretty nervy. And um, it's, I mean, obviously one of the richest games in sport, but also one of the cruelest because, you know, for, for, for two teams that have been you know, to um, finish so close to each other in the championship, to be separated by a penalty shootout. Um, I mean, a game of very few chances um, and neither team was really superior. Um, so I think, um, you know, that's a, that's a difficult thing. But uh, um, Huddersfield, I, I don't know, Huddersfield looked like a team that need four or five new players um, to, to compete in the Premier League. Um, it's going to rely on a couple of... Um, of, of extending a few loans. Um, they've got Aaron Moy in midfield. He's a Manchester City player. Izzy Brown in midfield. He plays for Chelsea. Um, you know, they are... Uh, uh, Danny Ward, actually, um, he plays in goal. He's, he's on loan from Liverpool. He will almost certainly be extended through next season because he's, he's not quite ready to play for Liverpool. Um, so I don't know whether that Huddersfield team... Um, can act as a, a a true barometer for what they're likely to achieve, to achieve next season. Um, Wagner, it's my first time actually in a press conference with David Wagner, and he's um, he's a very magnetic personality, and, and you can actually you don't have to spend very long in his presence to understand why players respond well to him. Um, he's very engaging. Um, he's very typical of the kind of I mean the, the lazy comparison with is with Klopp, of course, because he was his assistant previously at Dortmund. Um, <clears throat> and there are obvious similarities between you know between their mannerisms and the way they behave and the way they speak and you know kind of their general enthusiasm for the game. Um, I don't know. I, I, I um, I'm full of admiration for what they've achieved because they've managed to get promoted on, I think, um, a wage bill that came to eleven million pounds um, compared to and and that compared to some of the other teams in the championship is extremely low. Uh, and of course, they, they they finished in nineteenth place just a year ago. So you know they they've made a, effectively a, a kind of a, a sporting quantum leap. Um, I don't. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it it's going to be extremely difficult for them to survive. But the caveat, of course, is that you know with the broadcasting payment, um, you know all things are really possible. It's not like the old days where 
um, you know, teams were were terrified of of risking, um, uh, of taking a financial risk in their first season. You know, sort of following the Burnley model of well, we'll 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 do what we can with what we have, and if we come down, then we're not at any financial risk. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the size of the broadcasting contract makes a little bit of ambition possible. So I think it's a question to answer in maybe a month's time to, to see what they've been able to do. Um, you, you'd expect Aaron Moy to return, of course, as we said. Uh, Izzy Brown, yeah, quite a good player. I mean, not, I don't, he didn't scream Premier League ready to me. I mean, like, I, I'm happy to defer to people that watch him every season, uh, um, every week, but um, they look like a very good championship team rather than necessarily a team that belongs in the Premier League at the moment. Yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting point. And also, it's it's good that you touch upon the loan signings there because um, Alex and I uh, created a, a Huddersfield Tactics video a few weeks back. And there was a point yeah. that we made in the video as well, which is, you know, one of the impressive things about uh, Wagner and, and this team is that he's managed to assemble it on quite a uh, short notice. But yeah. also as a result of that, a lot of the players uh, are on loan from other clubs and it's difficult to, you know, know how long that can how how long that can last when some of those players are going to go back how influential players like Moy are and if you know Wagner can bring in new loan signings next season or as you say maybe spend a little bit of that money from that broadcasting contract uh, when they get promoted uh, to, to to maybe see if they can re- replace some of those loan players uh, so it'd be an interesting project to to watch next season um, what, what what I will say about that mate is I I think this sort of one of the the the, the, the kind of, I'm a I'm a I'm a Wagner novice here. Um, and I accept that, but uh, I think one of the, the the strengths he'll have going into next season is if if you are a a top eight Premier League manager um, with a young player, I don't think you'd have any qualms about allowing one of your youngsters to go on loan and be coached by him. No. Like as opposed to if you were going to loan a player to, for instance, uh, West Brom and Tony Pulis, you think, yeah, no, I I, I don't want to, I yeah. don't want to do that. I mean, you know, um, but he is, I mean, technically um, a very astute coach, clearly um, tactically very knowledgeable and, um, again, has managed to achieve an awful lot with... I mean, I I, I, I do watch a little bit of championship football um, and if you were to look at that Huddersfield team uh, just on paper, you would say there is absolutely no chance you, 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 you would win promotion with that group of players. Um, just because I was actually, I, I, I spent a bit of um, a bit of time with um, Sam Ty actually after the game. We, we went out for supper, and he was he was uh, baffled as to how Jonathan Hogg, former Villa player, was now in the Premier League. And actually, I mean, he's he's quite right. But in a way, that's 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 emblematic of of what um, Wagner has done. And you know, he, he's he's taken an extremely ordinary group to uh, an extraordinary level. Mm. Uh, you were also at the the other big final, weren't you? Yeah, Blackpool Exeter. Yes, yes. Uh, how was that, Seb? Uh, very odd, actually, because um, uh, obviously, if you imagine, Web Wembley is is obviously a three tiered stadium, and Exeter had um, Exeter managed to sell out all of the their their allocation of the bottom tier, which is pretty impressive for a, a League Two team, uh, and some of the second tier. Blackpool, um, because of the issues which continue to exist between their supporters and uh, the Oyston family, um, were, held a, a very public boycott of the final. And so they managed to sell, I th- I, they, they sold something between 5,000 and 6,000 tickets, um, which at Wembley is only really enough to fill just under half of the bottom tier. Um and also, because Wembley is so big, 5,000 people does not look like 5,000 people. Um, it looks very small. And so, you know, I, uh, the, the supporters who came were um, very enthusiastic and, you know, they made all the right noises and the right sounds and, you know, they waved the banners and the flags at full time when, when, when they won and, and, and terrific. But it was a very strange spectacle. I was actually, um, after the game, I, I was walking down, I was walking across the concourse down to um, down to where they, they hold the press conferences in Wembley and... Um, I was able to take a photo of, of uh, you know, you know when they 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 erect that little um, sort of temporary podium on the pitch so that yes. the fans, so the players can celebrate with the trophy. So I managed to take a picture of that, and, and all the um, all the Blackpool players are going mental, and in the foreground, the fans are loving it. But obviously, because of the perspective of it, um, there is just empty seats all the way behind them, yeah. which is a very strange thing to see. And um, it's quite actually, surreal. 
Yeah, very much so because I mean, I, I very fortunately with my own team, I've never been in this situation, but I just can't ima- envisage, envisage a scenario where my side got to a final and I felt it best not to go. Mm. And um, uh, yeah, just 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 a very strange occasion. Well, and it's, also, it's, it's difficult in the current situation to to even as a journalist to to discuss the the circumstances and perhaps the the most candid way or the way you'd like as well because of the nature of the the oyster well, family. They are yeah, they're extremely litigation happy to the point where they have sued some of their own fans successfully sued some of their own fans for damages. Um, I wrote a piece. Uh, during the game, which um, dealt solely in facts, but even even before publication, I thought, you know what, I'm going to redraft a few of those bits just because, you know, it, it's potentially not worth the hassle. Um, yeah. It's uh, It was very odd because also at the end, of course, uh, the players scale the steps up to, you know, to the Royal Box, collect the trophy, and there was Owen Oyston in his in his cowboy hat, and you know, and mm. uh, we're not going to mention it on the podcast because you know there's no reason. But just have a Google of uh, of Owen Oyston's past, and you'll see what kind of character you're dealing with. Um, and so that must be must have been even for the fans who who had decided to go to the game, um, and who've been able to put aside the way they've treated. And you know, bear in mind like Blackpool. Um, Bloomfield Road, which I think holds about seventeen and a half thousand fans, has averaged a gate of three and a half thousand this season. And so, for Gary Bowyer to insulate his players from that and to, you know, to finish where they did is is extremely impressive. But then, even to the point where after you've won the game and you're watching your fans go up there, uh, you're watching players go up there and collect the trophy, you still have to stand there and and, and watch, you know, mm. the symbol of your decline cheering on and kind of. Um, uh, you know, wading in on your your own joy, which is uh, just a very strange, uh, one of the strangest th- things I've ever seen at Wembley. Um, just because it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be a sort of a universally joyful occasion for for the winning team, but there was this sort of um, this regretful caveat about it all. Um, very odd, very odd day. Moving back into the Premier League, uh, Marco Silva has left yeah. Hull City and is now the manager of Watford. Um, he is, yes. This was this was slightly surprising, as I think he was he was you know quite sought after, and there were other clubs like Crystal Palace who were reported to be very interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, also you know, we come to the fact that Watford have have quite a laughable recent record with regards to manager turnover. Seven managers in the last five years. Uh, the Pozzo seem to to fire everyone almost as soon as you know the year is up. So, with with all that in mind, what do you make of this move, and what do you make of Marco Silva? <laughs> I, what what I hope um, it symbolises is a a kind of um, uh, some sort of organisational growth from Watford. In that this is an appointment which isn't just which doesn't just follow the, the the pattern of the kind of the 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 short sharp shock formula that, that they've used in recent seasons successfully by the way because they are still in the Premier League that's, that's mm. you know let's that, mention that um, I think um, for Silva to have taken this job because I I, I I don't pretend to be particularly cleared up on what Marco Silva's career options were but however for him to take that job ahead of uh, apparently, um, Porto, um, supposedly Southampton were interested, Palace too. Um, for him to to have agreed to it, I have to believe that he's given some assurances that this is a this is now a long term appointment rather than a, just a you know let's have a year out of you and then you're going. Because that look, I I know there are reasons for Kike Sanchez Flores and Walter Mazzari being dismissed. Um, you know the league table, particularly in Mazzari's case, um, but. Uh, you just as a manager, I don't see what you gain from from being at a club for a year. So, Silver, um, I mean, I, I I suppose everything he did at, Ast- uh, at Hull is now asterisk by the relegation. But I think if you look at some of their home performances, not necessarily the results, but some of their attacking play, uh, some of the way they, some of the ways in which they they, they press high up the field, um, the the manner in which they took the ball out of defence, how their how their centre backs. Instead of just being kind of, I mean, you know, for the first half of the season under Mike Phelan, they were just it was a it was kind of backs against the wall. Mm. Um, under Silver, it became a lot more expansive, and you saw sort of um, the development as a result of players like Harry Maguire, who became a, a very capable centre half. Uh, Andy Robertson, a fullback and sort of fullback slash wing back, became 
um, already a good player. I think you know most people would, would accept that, but um, really did develop on the silver. But I think um, the the attacking unit as a whole plays some beautiful football. Um, I know he had a good transfer window and he was able to bring in Grzycki and uh, Omer Niasse and uh, Lazarmarkovic. Um but I, I, I think some of the combinations between those players, which were, remember, constructed um, very quickly um, uh, within a group of players who we had no prior experience of working with, I, I think was very impressive. And then so it's all guesswork, of course, at this stage because it's, it's not even June yet. But if you consider the kind of attacking players that Watford have, who haven't necessarily performed that well, but who are still under contract there, so you're, you're kind of... Isaac Success and Roberto Pereira, um, both very good players. They have Adalberto Benaranda out on loan, who is um, a little bit of a maddening player, but like fabulously talented to watch. I mean, if you haven't heard of him, I mean, he's one of those guys that you can you can be forgiven for just going onto YouTube to have a quick look at. Um, he's he's a lot of fun, and and if he came back to Vicarage Road, um, I dare say Silver could do something pretty exciting with him. Um, and also, the, the, for all the criticism the Pozo family receive, it's worth remembering that they have one of the most impressive scouting networks in European football. I mean, it's very broad, but it's also very deep in the sense that, um, yes, they, they, they have been very good in the past at sort of extracting talent from South America. They were the first, they, they were responsible, for instance, for for bringing Alexis Sanchez out of Chile, um, uh, which was obviously very lucrative. Um, and they they are ambitious. They're ambitious, and they are good at spotting talent. And you mix that in with a, a manager who's able to impart a message quickly and successfully, and is also able to to coach some um, some very attractive attacking football. And I, I think it's a really good move, really exciting. If I was a Watford fan, I'd be very excited. I think. Yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, l- last week we had Nick Miller on the podcast. Yeah, and w- one of the things we were talking about. Antonio Conte and Chelsea's managerial record and uh, one of the things that's just reminded me of that is when you mentioned there that Pot- you know the, the Pozzo family have replaced uh, seven or well, six managers in, in, in five years with Marco Silva being the seventh but actually to great success as they're still in the Premier League one of the yeah. things that Nick and I discussed the idea of is you know is a kind of uh, the inverse of that idea that managerial stability leads to long-term success when actually repeatedly we we're, we're shown by teams like Watford you know and other and other teams often in you know in uh, trying to avoid relegation area that instability in ma- managerially can also work you know and that re- replacing perhaps you can't say that replacing the manager every year leads to to a, a, you know a concrete long-term solution right right but if your aim every year is to stay in the premier league and you do that with a new manager every year um then you know how can you call that anything but a success no well i i agree i mean i, I what, what i'll say a little addendum to that um is that yeah i you, you, you can't brand what watford have done a failure um but i would say that it's not just Watford's success hasn't been based solely on just changing managers. I think there are a lot of different parts to that system. Um, their identification of the managers they've brought in has been pretty good. I know that Kika Sanchez Forrest and Mazzari, they were both sacked, but they both did the job they needed to do, which was to work with a lot of international players, to work with a group who didn't have a lot of natural sort of togetherness. Um, so, you know, the identity is just as important as the actual principle of, right, well, we're going to change it, create this kind of constructive tension and then use that to fuel um, a relegation fight. Mm. Um, I I think, I mean, it, it, this is just a preference rather than, you know, uh, some sort of personal theory. I think there has to be a point with both, um, the, the Conte example is interesting because I think that... Um, I mean, I, I think the Conte example is perhaps a little misleading because I think that he is, he, uh, he's done tremendously well and if, that Chelsea thoroughly deserve to be champions. However, I think the magnitude of his performance has been exaggerated by just how bad Jose Mourinho's was last season. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, also, I think that that sort of change of manager scenario, um, it can only take you so far. So if, in, in Chelsea's case... Yes, you can bounce back to the Premier League with a squad of, you know, with, with, with fairly decadent ability. Yeah. However, if you want to challenge in Europe, I think you need that continuity. 
I don't think the Chelsea team that, that sort of dominated the Premier League this season would have done anything in, in the Champions League, for instance, against teams like Juventus, who have, you know, they've obviously got a very familiar house style, but also, you know, they've been working under Allegri now for, for two years. It's, there's a benefit to that. There's a sort of maturation that goes with it. For Watford, I think that um, if they ever want to be more than a team who just survive in the Premier League, and who just congratulate themselves every season on not being relegated, which at the moment they're fully entitled to do, don't get me wrong. They need to have a, uh, I don't know, just a bit more of a, a stable direction, I think. I mean, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that is my um, sort of, if that is a kind of a normality bias working. Um, but I, I don't know. There's just a sense. I don't. I don't believe that. Um, yeah. And also, to be honest, if you ever want to become the kind of club who can attract a manager of the, you know, the the, the highest ability, you cannot really have a reputation unless you're kind of Real Madrid for just sacking someone every year. Because there are other factors at work here. Yes, you you can you can pay a coach all they want, but ultimately also. If you're trying to attract a manager at the top of the, the European game, you're also having to worry about the conditions into which he brings, for instance, his family, his children, you know, schooling and housing. If you're just a club that's going to offer nothing really more than 12 months, it's going to be pretty difficult to, um, you know, to attract someone, um, someone, someone to North London on that basis. Mm. Well, well, let's talk about someone now who is uh, uh, no longer being attracted to North London. Yeah. Sam Allardyce. I actually mm-hmm. don't know if he's going to continue to live in London or not. It was a it was a failed link uh, to discuss his resignation from Crystal Palace, um, and also Allardyce claims to be uninterested in in, in further work in management. So yeah. he's he's an interesting character. I've I've always been sort of you know distantly a f- uh, distantly fond of of Sam Allardyce, not necessarily as a manager, but but more as as you know, a character to observe as part of the world of football. I find him quite interesting and, and quite amusing. Um, uh, you wrote an article, an article recently for, for com uh, about yeah. about him, and you describe, describe him as a manager who operates within extremely narrow parameters. He favours a very particular style of play, trusts only a certain type of player, and probably, as a consequence, only specialises in one area of management, which I, I think we can all assume is relegation battle. Um, when well, Allardyce... relegation battle, but also, I mean, <laughs> let, let me let me broaden that a little bit. Yes, relegation battle, but I, I would say um, his specialty is is taking a team who are underperforming and returning them to par, not overperformance, but par. Okay, um, in he's, the, the sense... he's the mean rescinder. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes okay. Look at Sunderland; he obviously exceeded that expectation a little bit, so he went beyond the mean. However, um, I think he's someone who benefits from um, inheriting dysfunction because he's kind of the guy that comes in and presses the reset button. Everything becomes very structured, very organised, very low ambition, but you know, effective. And so, as a result, as a result of everything which has preceded his arrival, so at Palace, for instance, um, Alan Pardew, who really should never have been coaching in the Premier League. Um, and that, that's been shown, that was shown at Newcastle, that became shown at Palace, a guy that can do something for a year and, and sort of trades off kind of some kind of, you know, um, intangible worth. But then ultimately, uh, at, at beyond a certain tipping point, has no tactical response to the issues which eventually blight his team. Um, Allardyce is the, is, is the perfect antidote to that kind of guy. Um, and his career is based on Allardyce never goes into a situation which is going well and takes it further. If you look back into his entire career, that's never been the case. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I would still call that narrow, of course. And, you know, over time, people get bored of him because, you know, they, they assume, you know, some of them fans after last season, they'd have thought, well, look at what he's been able to do in this six months. You know, in two years, we'll be a mid table. Yeah. Mm, never really works that way. The football never really develops, it never looks prettier. You know the team sort of his teams have a ceiling. Well, this this is this is interesting though because we, we are going to talk about the Bolton example now because uh, Allardyce was that was the manager of Bolton. I mean, how long ago? Fifteen years ago now. Yeah, um, yeah. and he he was seen for an albeit brief period as someone with with new ideas, a trend bucker. Uh, his use of data in particular was very modern. 
Um, and but now you know now he'll he'll almost certainly be remembered as that guy that you were just describing. You know that the 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 the, uh, the mean rescinder. Um, so is is that? But Joe, of... do you, do you not think? I mean, I yeah. I, but is that? Is that in any way unfair? I mean, no, you know, it's 50- it's not. Uh, what, what I'm getting at, um, you know, what I'm interested to hear from you is how that happens to someone. You know, how can okay, how can well, Sam Allardyce go from from being this um, this guy who's set, setting new trends in terms of how modern managers might work in the Premier League and doing very exciting, interesting things with the football team to you know regressing to this uh, this kind of same formulaic style of management year in, year out, and doing, you know, a good job, and as you mentioned, of what he's good at, but never taking teams uh, further than that. H- how does that happen? Well, I mean, I, firstly, I, I think that kind of the um, sort of the uh, the evangelism era of Allardyce's career has been slightly overplayed. Um, you know, he, he is not a Luddite. I think most people accept that. Um, he, but... The idea, I mean, I, I heard an anecdote from someone the other day who'd actually met him at a function, and um, a guy I know quite well, and um, you know has, has no reason to lie about it. He said he met Allardyce, and Allardyce introduced him as the person who created the um, the understanding of the importance of conditioning in football, like physical conditioning. Right? You know, no, you didn't. You know, I mean, it's it, 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 it's 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 just it, it's a little bit of a fish tale. I mean, it just. Um, the the data thing, yes, he you know he wore that headset at, at Bolton, and you know sometimes he sat high up in the stand too. Yeah, if you look through European, it, 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 he is not the first manager to do that. I mean, if you're going to talk about sort of um, managers who were influential at that time and who were really trendsetters, well, you know, before the turn of the millennium, uh, you, you don't look beyond Arsene Wenger really um, in terms of someone who. Uh, changed the um, sort of minutiae uh, within English football. Or, you know, changes sort of the, the different focuses in match preparation and stuff like that. I don't. I, don't I think believe... I think Allardyce was doing something very very different to, to what Wenger was doing. I think Allardyce was ju- judging judging the game of football and looking at um, chance creation and looking at where the the best possible areas were for his, you know, wh- which type of players to stand in, you know, and how to create the maximum number of chances. And I think from from a from a maths point of view, I think you know maybe maybe that is the link between that Bolton team and what he did in his future career. How, how what is the best possible form of football to consistently achieve what this team can achieve? And uh, you know, and, and maybe maybe that's why you see Allardyce teams not not losing a lot of games, not winning a lot of games, kind of performing to their to their, you know, total mid-table ability. I think. Yeah, I don't agree, mate. I, I, I just, I, I don't. I mean, it just doesn't tally with kind of. I mean, if you, if you let's return to the Bolton thing. Okay, I mean, uh, it, it's it's an unlikely success story because it involves Bolton, and I, you know, I dare say there was, you know, m- a lot of that was instructed by data and analysis and kind of methods which are now normal but weren't then. But then. You know, a lot of that success also hinged on spending an awful lot of money on some very uh, some players who commanded enormous wages. You remember that Bolton team for sort of Kevin Davis and Nicky Hunt and Yussi Askelainen and and you know players like that. But then, you, you know, it, it it it's still a success, but it's a success which was also partly founded on paying JJ Kocha's wages, Fernando Hierro's wages, even Campo's wages, uh, Yuri Djokovic's wages. I mean, the, these are not like. Uh, yeah, allowing a team from that catchment area and with that particular history to reach the heights that it did is definitely, without question, a, a tremendous achievement for which he deserves recognition. But the idea that there was sort of some kind of um, moneyball miracle, no, I, I don't go along with that. Um, I put personally, I, I, I would say that the football is... Uh... It's a fantastical sport, Seb, and we should always print the myth. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I, I, but it, also, look, I, I, I mean, the you, what you can't do with Allardyce is keep hold of the Bolton thing forever, because it, it, it's just it's not right. It's like me saying, well, you know, fifteen years ago, I used to weigh seven, you know, one hundred and seventy pounds. Yeah, I don't now, and I haven't for a long time. So that is not the reality anymore, and his reality is is Blackburn and Newcastle and West Ham and Palace. 
and Sunderland. That is Sam Allardyce. Well, by that Bolton, argument, his reality is retirement. You know, he doesn't manage Bolton too. now, but he once did. You know, I think that's that's the point I'm making. He once did, but then I, yeah, I, I, I don't think you can. Um, I, I, I don't think that that example can be allowed to stand alone forever, um, because it hasn't been repeated. And it hasn't been repeated despite him having far greater resources. And yeah, I mean, the game has also changed a little bit. And for whatever reason, if he was a very innovative coach once upon a time, he himself hasn't evolved at a rate which allows him to be innovative again now or even within at any point really within the last 10 years. Um, wherever Allardyce has gone, um, maybe he is an excellent coach. I'm, I'm quite certain he is, and you know many of his ex-players attest to that. However, wherever he has gone, he's also spent an awful lot of money. Um, and yeah, there's some things we can't actually talk about because of you know that lingering threat of uh, yeah. Let's just stop that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you mentioned someone like Mark Curtis. That's all. That's where I'm going to go, and we can't do that. So mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Let, let's shut that down. Yep. Um, Elliot Rothwell wrote a yep. piece recently for umaxit.com uh, discussing how players like David Luiz and Per Mertesacker are done a disservice when it is suggested that their improved performances are solely down to playing in the middle uh, of a three-at-the-back formation. Yep. Uh, Elliot compares this to defensive midfielders saying, um, defensive midfielders, when praised in a three-man midfield, rarely have their good displays subsumed within a wider uh, well, that's what a three-man midfield does, thread of logic. So I wanted to ask you, Seb, well, this is you know, slightly different from what we've been talking about already, a little bit less broad, but what do you think about this? Is it is it not fair to suggest, for example, that, that David Luiz is better suited to, to being in a three-at-the-back system, which is something that we've actually discussed on, on this podcast this season? Really hard question to answer because I I kind of I w- agree with both arguments, really. Um I, I remember I remember subbing Elliot's piece and nodding along in agreement to a lot of that. Um, but, um, I mean, you, you just, yeah, I, I don't think you can conclusively say one or the other. I mean, I, David Luiz, um, I, I still believe deep down that all the things that David Luiz was criticised for in, during his first spell in English football, I still think they exist in his game. I still think they are there to be found you know, in the right circumstances. And actually, to be honest, if you watch some of the games where in which Chelsea conceded goals again this season without the kind of veneer of, oh, aren't they f- fantastic and aren't they brilliant and Kante and Hazard and yay, brilliant Champions League. If you look at some of his performances, not that great. Um, but that being said, obviously, like the position that he's been played in and the players, I think the most important thing is actually not necessarily the role he has within the Chelsea team, but the players he's now surrounded with. Mm. The things like um, the stability of that central midfield, I think is um, eliminates his capacity to, to kind of, to break his team's own defensive line and pursue the ball. I think that's because, you know, he's able to, he, he, obviously he doesn't feel compelled to do that. He's able to rely on players ahead of him and around him a little bit more. They are more stable. Mm. I think, I think the the sort of the way Chelsea have been constructed, not in a, a shape sense, but just in a personnel way, I think that suits his game a little bit more. Um, yeah, I would I would agree, and, and also I think you know one of the um, one of the massive pros of David Luiz's game is his uh, distribution ability. You know, yeah, he's, he's a very good passer of the ball. He's um, a brilliant footballer. Yeah, no, he, he really is, and and I think that that's what's that's what's interesting about him playing in in that you know position in the middle of the back three. Um, Elliot makes the point in his article that you know um, if we, we're talking about David Luiz making making mistakes and perhaps that being negated by two centre backs either side of him that that can't really be true because David Luiz is often you know the last you know the last man furthest back but also in that position you know is given the responsibility of distributing the ball when your two uh, fellow centre backs are being pressed so you yeah. know he he's he's ideal there really and and I think. I'm not really sure it's an insult or even a criticism to say that okay, in a more maybe a more common two at the back centre centre back partnership, um, you know you are an average player. I was not David Lewis for example, but you know someone might be an average player uh, in a three at the back system in this particular role, which happens to suit all of your strengths. You're an excellent player, you know, and I don't think I don't think people are saying 
or perhaps people are, but I mean, I'm certainly not saying that any defender in the three at the back system is going to be better by the fact that there no. are more numbers around. That's just not true. Um, but perhaps I don't. I don't think it's unfair to say a player like David Luiz. And let's mention Per Mertesacker as well, because Elliot also mentions him in the article. I think it's also fair to say that someone like Per Mertesacker uh, might benefit from that sort of system simply because he's quite slow and he's uh, quite old. And I think if you're in a position where, again, well, if you're if you're if you're the central player in a back three and you're old and slow, sorry, Per Mertesacker, um, if the responsibility uh, falls on the two centre backs outside you um, to cover the larger amount of ground, particularly potentially against quick players in wide areas. Yeah, without question that suits you. And on all, 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 all Mertesacker has to do, re- and not all. It's obviously still a very difficult role to play, but all he has to do is use his experience of the yeah. game, which he has a lot of because he's very old and he's a very good defender, uh, to make sure that himself and his uh, partners are in the correct positions most of the time. I mean, yeah, that's, exactly that. That again, that's another example of how that particular role perfectly suits you know his strengths, and I don't think that's a criticism of those players, and I don't think that's. Uh, taking anything away from them but I think you know also it's something that we should recognize we talked about David Luiz uh, not too long ago in this vein because uh, well I, in fact it was last week with Nick Miller we talked about Conte potentially continuing with the three at the back system next season or you know having seen examples of it being not found out because obviously it's you know it's been it's been used before but other teams uh, ne- negating it a little bit better, I think maybe one of the better examples is Mourinho's United. Obviously, Arsenal uh, also did that quite well. So I think it would be interesting to see what he does do with that formation next season. And one of the worries could be, I'm not saying that it is, but it could be that if they do revert to a two-at-the-back system or if they change change the setup somewhat in that way, uh, that, that David Luiz m- might not be playing to his you know his maximum capacity. Yeah, I mean, well, I think I, 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 my own personal belief is that beyond the tactical system, like I, the, the first question I'd ask is, who is he playing with, not what shape is he playing in? Mm. Like, I think that's look I, I, having having two centre backs outside him is is obviously very beneficial and amplifies what he is good at and negates what he's bad at. But it depends, you know. I I, I think I think it's a great help, for instance, that. Cesar Azpilicueta, um, who is a repurposed fullback, is one of those centre halves. Because who better to have in those wide areas than a player that grew up playing in them um, and that is extremely good one on one against a winger, for instance, or a, a sort of a, 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 a shallow, wide attacking midfielder? Um, that's that's a great help. So if you were to replace Azpilicueta, not I have no transfer knowledge whatsoever, of course. But if you were to replace Azpilicueta with a more static type, then I don't know. So maybe that's the way around to look at it. OK, Seb, uh, thanks very much for your time. And we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, Joe.